This episode of the Planet Microcap podcast is brought to you by Friedman LLP, a top 40 global accounting, tax, and business consulting and advisory firm, providing a full spectrum of services for public and private companies since 1924. Contact Friedman when you will need to raise capital and adhere to U.S. standards. The Friedman partners will work diligently with you to provide the financial assurance, regulatory, and transactional services you need. When the stakes are highest, Friedman makes sure you are well equipped. For more information and to get a Friedman free consultation, please call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. Again, for more information and a free consultation, call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. And thank you all so much for your support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Craft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. You're listening to episode 177. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. When you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the Microcap message. Save the date. We just announced our next virtual conference, the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event, which will be held on August 17 through 19, 2021. The website is now live. You can find full details on the event at conference.snn.network. Registration is open, so go click the register button once you are there to receive all the updates as they come live. So uh, again, that's the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event. All the information is at conference.snn.network, and I look forward to seeing you all there. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Frank Holmes. He is the CEO and Chief Investment Officer at U.S. Global Investors, G-R-O-W on NASDAQ, and he's also the Chairman of the Board of Hive Blockchain Technologies, H-I-V-E on the TSX Venture, and H-V-B-T-F on the OTCQX. Now, I've known and interviewed Frank for a long time, so featuring him on the pod is long overdue. But the timing couldn't be better as Frank has been on the front lines of crypto and he needs to be fully up to date on all the macro events that could affect the digital assets space. So we chat at length on all the biggest headlines in crypto, what they mean, as well as how the crypto volatility compares to his experience investing primarily in natural resources. I also wanted to point out that we recorded this interview in two parts. We did the first recording back on May 12th, and then I actually invited Frank back because there's so much news and the headlines that were happening since then uh, that we recorded a second part on May 27th. So uh, we, I decided I wanted to combine it into one interview. So that's if you if you hear me bring it up, uh, I think about 50 minutes in, you know that that's why. So thank you again for tuning in to episode 177 of the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Frank Holmes. everybody to the Planet Microcap podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. 
And I'm very excited to introduce our next guest here for Planet Microcap. Uh, you might have seen him uh, on a recent panel that we did uh, at, at the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual, talking about what's going on in crypto. Uh, I've had Frank on many times, uh, you know, whether it's a, our short Wall Street View interviews, talking about uh, the two companies that he is both the, uh, the CIO and CEO of, which is U.S. Global Investors, publicly traded company, symbol is GROW on NASDAQ, G-R-O-W, or with high blockchain technologies, where he's the executive chairman of the company as well. Symbols, of course, is H-I-V-E on the TSX Venture and H-V, what is that on OTC QX? What is it? H-V-A-T-F, right? On, on the QX? H-V-B-T-F. H-V-B-T-F on the OTC QX. I'd like to introduce my guest today, Frank Holmes. Frank, thank you for joining me on Planet Microcap. How are you doing? It's great to be with you. It's great to have you on. So this is our, this is our first time having you on this podcast. And, and as you know, because uh, I talked your ear off about it, you know, it's all about educating the next generation of investors, how to invest in microcap stocks. And as I've already said, we've talked many times uh, with you on, on different platforms at SNN Network, but I've never gotten your full background and really how you got to where you're at today. So, you know, Frank, I got to ask, where did your passion for investing begin? Well, I'm the oldest of seven, um, grew up in downtown inner city Toronto. Uh, well, my guardian father was an Anglican uh, priest. My mother was a elected official for education and originally an emergency nurse that went into uh, social, um, uh, social work. And so this is in downtown Toronto. From there, uh, I went on to went to investments and I was going to, I was actually going into um, uh, medicine. And uh, it's interesting because my uncle used to be Dean of medical school uh, at Western had informed me that socialized medicine is going to cap my income. I'll have debt until I'm 60. And uh, why don't you just ch change the letters of, he of health to wealth? Uh, he said, because people you know, sacrifice their health for money. Uh, people marry for money, divorce for money, steal for money. Money is very important to them. And so if you can help them with their wealth, uh, as much as you want to care and help them with their health, uh, I think you'd be a great uh, contribution. And he knew that I was an entrepreneur. And so I'd always paid for my own, made investments at a very young age. Uh, and I never really made a stock market investment until I became an analyst in 1978. Uh, and I was originally a quant analyst, basically looking at five-year government bonds in Canada versus dividend stocks been paying for five years. And what was that trend? And remember back in those days, inflation was starting to explode, just like it is again today. It's almost, uh, you're talking about a huge cycle of peaking interest rates to falling uh, and inflation. So I learned about the quant approach. I applied that to gold stocks. I built a professional trading desk to deal with gold stocks. And that's how I got to learn of you as global investors based in San Antonio, Texas. Um, they had some financial issues. And uh, so I came in and cleaned it up, put some capital in. Um, and I was just blessed. I was very lucky as I went from research trading into corporate finance in Canada. My first uh, big real investment was a company I took public was called uh, Franco Nevada. Uh, didn't really uh, totally grasp the significance it would be, but I knew that Pierre Lassan and Seymour Schulich were incredible people and they were older than me. They were mentors. So I was, I was blessed to be able to have those people in my life. And, uh, and then I went on to create a technology company called ISG. It was taken out and it was a big winner. And then it was another company called Digital Music Express, uh, which became uh, Liberty Media. So I was fortunate about meeting people that uh, had great disciplines and great EQ and IQ uh, and I made enough money to be able to purchase control of U.S. global investors. I don't like the snow unless I'm skiing. Uh, and so Toronto was just not the best place. And I got an opportunity to move to Texas. And I love the heat. Uh, and so I moved down and, and it, with two young boys. And uh, it's been an incredible journey uh, for us. You know, Frank, so I got to ask, because it's with your history, it seems like you were always very early, right? You know, uh, what what would you say is some of the reasons for that? You know, how did you know that some of these things may or may not have worked out? As you said, Franco Nevada not even realizing what that would become, you know, uh, 
than uh, I think it, the media company before it became Liberty. I mean, you know, what, what, what's some of the reasonings for that? I think, you know, it's a combination um, of hard work uh, and having now research has come out that would validate it would be a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Uh, and that makes you just more curious uh, that I, I just want to know where things are going and why. Uh, and, and that sort of always drove me. And then I want to know who the shakers and players were. What are they doing? What makes them special? I read books. I'm a geek. And, and I had to learn about this operative word called EQ from being the geek uh, reader. Uh, and, and I think that my disciplines in science going into wanting to go into medicine, they really helped you know, understanding biological models helps you understand micro cap stocks and entrepreneurs uh, understanding the laws of physics, helping to understand the momentum of stock prices uh, forces equal to MA uh, mass, the market cap size versus acceleration. That's the force and recognizing how you can apply those models to the capital markets and chemistry. Well, chemistry is all about, unleashing energy and or contracting it. So you have exothermic or endothermic reactions. You need a catalyst. Well, that's the same thing with a stock. A goal discovery is a catalyst. Um, you meet the promoters in your life, entrepreneurs that really are visionaries. And what do they do? They, they release energy. Then you can meet those other people that absorb all your energy. And you don't know why you've been with them for an hour and you got a big headache. Uh, and it's all chemistry. So you can apply that to people. You can apply it to capital markets. So I think that journey, the other operative word is called synchronicity. If you really believe as, as, as Carl Jung talked about this thing that you attract things that you feel uh, that you develop a passion for. And, uh, and I think that they're the parts and never dismiss your journey. We all have a different journey and it's the ability to go look at it. And I really look, when I say look back at a growth mindset is very, very important to have. And with your children, that your children are rewarded, not because they're blessed with brains or good looks or ability to run, jump and dance or whatever. They're blessed because of their hard work, because hard work is a choice. Being blessed is a lucky DNA. Very big difference. And I think a lot of kids get confused when every kid gets a medal for trying. Well, that's, they didn't really try. They just showed up. That doesn't reward the choice of hard working and trying to be one, two, or three. Uh, and that's what I think growth mindset people are. They're more performance inspired. It doesn't matter the industry, what they're in. Well, what's, what's interesting about your journey, you know, especially to where you're at, you know, now executive chairman of High Blockchain, you know, launching uh, ETF, Jets ETF, you know, it, it seems that that growth mindset has allowed you to say, you know what, I'm willing to take this risk based on these catalysts because I have the experience and understanding what the opportunity might look like if this catalyst ends up happening the way I think it will. You know, so what are some of the things that you think about when you see these potential catalysts on the horizon and you're like, you know what, that's worth the risk right there. You know, what, what, how, do you, how do you evaluate that? Uh, I think it's a combination of, of circles you move in and you make it a, that you have a purposeful decision with your time. There's one thing my, my father taught me as a young boy, you know, that was there's only one thing and him being a, an Anglican priest or Episcopalian called America. Is only one thing God gives us all equally, the same 24 hours. And what you do with your 24 hours versus someone else is so often the success and outcomes you'll have in life. So value your time and therefore value family and relationships and other people and recognize that because you're making that choice of how you're using your time. So you, you have to become thoughtful. When I first moved to Texas, friends of mine in Toronto, I said, I don't know anyone here except for like a couple of employees that uh, had 160 employees and they knew me only because being the commander, but they didn't really know me and I had no friends. So they said, oh, YPO, Young Presidents Organization. I qualified, I joined, I had 70 new friends of all high achievers in a complete diversified spectrum of, of industries. And I learned from the one thing is that with, when you're at that top of that game, you have similar stresses 
of what are you going to do to grow? How are you going to defend? How are you going to take up your, bring up your family, your children? How are you going to manage debt? How are you going to manage your equity? All these things are really cut up here and you can't go to your vice presidents to discuss these issues. You have to, uh, when it comes to especially family issues. So YPO allows you to have this network. And then that parlays in the same thing, going to investment conferences. Uh, that's what I miss the most. Uh, video conferences are fantastic. Uh, but the energy of meeting someone, uh, other like-minded people, and it doesn't matter if they want to be the, um, a, a doctor that's a dean of the medical school. Uh, uh, the former dean here of UTSA's medical school is a close friend. So you, you learn from these other people. So I tell young people, be really picky, you know, picky of, of who you spend time with as your friends. Are they adding value to your life? Um, and you know the uh, the value algorithm? It's V is equal to A over T, at. So what is that? A is for actions, T is for time. You create value by what you do over that time period. It could be one minute, it could be one day, one week, one month. And you are wasting time and you are destroying the value if you waste what your actions are. So when you recognize that, you can create value wherever you go. Very good. All right. So Frank, what, get us to how we're, where you're at today. You know, uh, you, you explained how, you know, you saw an opportunity with the U S global came in, put some capital restructured and now, and, and then that was off and running, you know, and then from there launching jets and hive, you know, tell, tell us how we're, how you've arrived to, to this point in, in time. Well, every morning, every night before I go to bed and when I wake up, I take a moment to thank God for blessing me with this, uh, this health, this wealth, and wisdom. And it's very important that you have gratitude. Now, lots of MIT research, et cetera, shows that when you have gratitude, then you see things differently. If you consume yourself with resentfulness, jealousy, fearfulness, uh, then it, you, you miss those 24 hours in a day. By the way, 24 hours a day now, they estimate we produce 60,000 thoughts. So the only way to have a healthy sleep and to wake up with another great day is to start off with a form of gratitude. Uh, and, and I look back and I did not realize at the time when I met Sir John Templeton. And Sir John Templeton always started his annual meeting and his big investment meetings with a prayer. And he always asked God to please guide him to make good decisions. So Ian McAvity uh, was so comical and, and very witty. Uh, he said, uh, most of us buy a stock and then pray, God, please go up. Please help it to go up. Whereas uh, Sir John would always start off with, with, before I buy it, please guide me that I'm making a good decision to buy it. And, uh, and then just let it go. Uh, and so I think that that's a, an important part of the aspect of waking up every day. And when you ask for wisdom, the wisdom is I make mistakes every day. I wake up, I make it. And, and am I learning from those mistakes? Uh, and that's what's really key. So what did I learn was I did not pivot to mutual to ETFs fast enough. Uh, I was doing so well in mutual funds, and and all of a sudden the mutual fund world really, after two thousand and nine, went into a redemption mode. It didn't matter if you're a five star or no star. There was just basically redemption mode as ETFs continued to grow. And one of my directors was really urging and pushing me. And, and my research showed I, I am known for gold, but I was too late. You already had all the Van Eck products out there. Uh, you had the GLD, so, but my reputation. So what am I going to do that's different? And I was flying all over the world, and I recognized that my options to fly had shrunk by 25%, and the price of my tickets had jumped by 100%. So somebody's making money here. And so therefore my curiosity kicked in and started looking at the airlines. And I said, wow, they've come out of bankruptcy, did all this research. There is no airlines ETF. They're associated. I relate to them with my global travels. That would be my narrative. This is a great product. I see that all the bankruptcies are behind us. They have new pricing power, the revenue, everything's going up. Launched it. Everyone said, it, uh, at the beginning, it was very successful with hedge funds. They needed something to go long and short various airlines uh, and value investors. But then really a lot of people were, oh, Buffett doesn't like airlines. 
So now all of a sudden, it's three years later, Buffett falls in love with airlines. Uh, I said he would do it at the beginning. Uh, and then they took off and went up to 100 million. And then the airlines always crashed during a, a global pandemic or crisis. And they did. The difference is this time is that we had millennials come in who had done research on their own on the internet. Uh, and they said that the airlines jumped back 80 to 120 percent. They looked at 9 11, they looked at 2003 SARS crisis, they looked at 2008 2009 global uh, economic crisis, and they did. So they started piling in. Buffett gets out, and guess what? 25,000 through Robinhood alone. Uh, bought around $12 and it went to 28. So they were actually pretty accurate and everyone you know, dumps on Mel and Robin Hood and, and millennials and I have a complete different experience. So my lesson to you is if you want to start an ETF product, it's much easier if you're the only person in that space. So you're the first mover advantage. Uh, two, uh, you have to prepare that you that you're going to have to sink about five million dollars over five years, and I did this research on looking at my Eastern European fund. That was the first fund of its category, and that thesis was a macro thesis of Eastern Europe coming together, and the and you could get Poland at one third of the cost of Germany uh, with the same education. So it was a natural and played that that four million dollar fund went to twelve million, went back to four, and then went to a big end. So it just it takes that time period to recognize that. Uh, I think we've now had about seven different types of companies and, and funds that we've launched that have gone to a billion dollars. Uh, and I recognize that you have to really know the narrative. Besides the research, you have to really understand the story with the facts. Uh, and you have to invest your own time and money into it to, to believe it. So it's been a big win. Uh, I'm very thrilled about GoAU, uh, Go, but because it's done what it said would do. We did uh, 8,000 hours of regressional study, quant approach to picking gold stocks, where I started with that quant approach. And it's outperformed the GDX and GDXJ since it's launched in the past year. It's outperformed it by a wide margin. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled by, that, you know, it's, but I just wish it was a billion dollar product, uh, but I think it'll go there. Uh, the Jets was the only product, and that was the interesting part. You know, the, and so far, Touchwood, I have no competition coming in. So I'm fast tracked to launch in Latin America. We're now in Mexico, Mexico City. Uh, Lima is next. I hope you know, this is the goals in San Diego, Chile, uh, so that we we have Latin America covered, and then Europe, uh, and then Asia. Uh, and, and this gives you this sort of what they call that moat around your that product because it is a fascinating product. It's it's outperformed the uh, the New York Stock Exchange Global Airline uh, Index, and that was always as bogey. Can I create a quant model that could outperform it? Well, it's done it after fees, so I'm thrilled about it delivering for the investors what they actually anticipate to get. Um, it's a huge win for Grow. Um, you know, last year in March when I COVID started. Uh, assets all collapsed and I was sweating. I mean, I was sweating. I'm losing $22,000 a day. And what am I going to do with employees? Cut mine, cut my salary, cut this, cut that. What am I going to do? And then all of a sudden in comes the minnows. And as the minnows came in, buying the bottom, buying the bottom. And then after that, for the ecosystem was so important. The, the operative word here is price discovery. The minnows are important for price discovery. And then came the dolphins and then came the tunas and then the sailfish and then the sharks and then the whales and the killer whales. Now I got a complete ecosystem and it goes from trading 40,000 to 8 million shares a day. So I, I, I think that that's what was really important exercise from last year. And a lot of them now listen uh, through podcasts. How do they get their information? YouTube and podcasts. Take a look at YouTube revenue. It's, it's a monster what it's done. Uh, and, and so I think that this is sort of a game changer of information sharing for, for the public. Uh, I have a new product I hope to come out with very shortly. And guess what? There's no one else in the space. Very important. And does it have the wind hitting a sale like I talked about the airlines coming out of a saga? Yes, it does. Does it relate to my global resources, my expertise there? Yes, it does. So I'm thrilled about 
you know, getting ready and position for that. It wakes me up. And, uh, and every day I'm looking at information. I'm bombarding my employees. They're like avalanche of emails coming at them uh, to know this industry. So I'm excited about that. And then at the same time, every day I'm spending hours on Hive. So I'm learning about all this new technology and uh, NFTs. What's our NFTs and how do they function? So I'm 66 years old and I got to keep my brain building those neurons. Now, I was told that if you want to build vocabulary of one new word and you can spell it and remember it, it, you build 2,000 new neurons. So I'm hoping that I can build you know, at least 10,000 new neurons every day so that I do not become afflicted with Alzheimer's. Uh, and uh, two weeks ago, I ran the Boston Half Marathon, uh, which is good. I just, I made it. That's the most important part. You finished. Uh, That's good. That's the best part. <laughs> All right. So Frank, let, let's, let's dovetail into Hive a little bit, you know, because listen, when we first met, it, we, we talked gold. We were talking about gold resources, where we're at in the cycles, you know, all the typical questions you get asked at all these conferences and by geniuses like me all the time, you know, uh, and I say that very facetiously. I am not a genius for anybody that doesn't know my sarcasm yet, but you know, what was, what was the main catalyst for you that you now were like, all right, crypto, I think is potentially something big here. I remember in the past, you said you tried to create the ETF, but they wouldn't let you. So you're like, screw it. I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be the executive chairman of this company and go from there. And that'll be my exposure. So, you know, what was it about crypto that initially got you in? And then give us maybe a little bit of that story about how then Hive came into, into the picture. So coming back to being like a professor, uh, the CIA likes to describe people by your explicit knowledge and your tacit knowledge. So this explicit knowledge is your degrees, your, your academic achievements and knowledge and your facts. Uh, and if you're a person that uh, is just an overload with facts, you're known as the geek. Uh, on the other side is the tacit knowledge. That is your hands-on, uh, meeting people, um, feeling it, building a model, whatever it is, is you, you're, you really get your fingernails dirty, your calluses on your fingers. Uh, running a marathon is totally different than working out on a treadmill. I mean, one is really tacit knowledge and uh, going up and down real hills, rain. When you're on a treadmill, you don't have to deal with freezing rain like run the New York, uh, my first big uh, event, New York uh, marathon. But it, it's that tacit knowledge is so powerful. So I'm doing all this knowledge. I'm getting bombarded by my godson and my son about what's happening in crypto. And I'm trying to read about it and, and figure it all out, what's going on, trying to launch an ETF. That comes to a, a dead end. And I want to be the first to come up with a Bitcoin ETF. So that's not going to happen. I got all this knowledge. And so I get offered the opportunity. And my friends there, they dismissed it. You know, the guys, the gold guy, you know, well-known Frank Justra. He thought that Bitcoin was just a short-term phase. And the regulators would shut it down. Uh, and I didn't think what, so. So, What year was this, by the way? Um, spring of 2017. Okay. And uh, so it progresses along. And, and I said, no, no, this is real. And in the summer, uh, I said, I'll... I put up $5 million. I became their institutional order. And immediately $30 million came in. Uh, then I went public. And then institutions followed us. They believed in the vision. And we raised $200 million from accredited investors and institutions in Canada. It was the first public company to do crypto mining on an industrial scale. Uh, and it was a darling. Uh, and, and with that, what I had at the beginning was a lot of gold investors that were reluctant to buy Bitcoin or Ethereum, particular Bitcoin on a crypto exchange, uh, used Hive as their proxy. And so we had this incredible volume uh, that showed up last year, 2020, trading 1.7 billion shares in Canada, almost a half a billion here in the US, 20 million in Germany. Um, it was bigger than Grayscale's uh, Bitcoin trust over the counter here. And, and so we have this broad following of technology people, People looking for first mover, gold investors, and uh, it has been a you know a, a heck of a ride, uh, both up and down. It's the fastest paper profit I ever made. In one week, my five million was worth 100, 100 million, and at the bottom, it was worth two million. Uh, I kept it all, 
and I wrote it right back up to uh, over 50 million. And, um, and so I, I think from that end, you learn, you learn from these, I learned so much from the cycles in micro cap stocks, especially micro cap gold mining. And, and I understood that these, these winters, they like to call them, they can last X number of months. And how do you deal with well, cripples brand new? But I think, you know, I, I was very fortunate to be able to get that bottom on it. Uh, I think for your listeners, you know, you, you want to think of where that new technology, the tacit knowledge came from. I mentioned the explicit. The tacit knowledge came from going to a consensus conference in New York City and seeing a trillion dollar company CEO who's got a CFA and never intends investment conferences, Abigail Johnson, speak. I mean, she's speaking at a crypto event, but she doesn't speak at a, 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 any type of investment event. And she talks about what they're doing, why they like blockchain, and she's mining in her own back office. So that was that part of that tacit knowledge. And I never saw where they charge an incredible amount to attend the conference. I mean, you never get for investment conferences that you put on where they can charge you $30,000 to put your logo in the bathrooms. Think about that. I mean, it's mind boggling. And, and I never saw so many young kids in flip flops and knapsacks that had made a couple of million dollars on their Bitcoin. Uh, and so I, that, that, Tacit knowledge really woke me up that something else is happening. Uh, the research led me down to understanding the nodes that you have. At that time, 30,000 scientists around the world working on Ethereum, 10,000 nodes, detailed analysis on um, uh, Bitcoin around the world, analyzing the blockchain, knowing where the blockchain is. 10,000 people. You don't have 10,000 analysts on gold stocks. That was a wake-up call. You don't have 10,000 analysts looking at luxury stocks or jets. You don't have that. This space you do. Something big is happening. And going to England and saying, uh, there's an event that you can go to. And I went to the city and it was like, a, like out of uh, Charles Dickens' movie, walking down dreary London, rain, and going into this building and going downstairs. And there's 80 people packed on a Tuesday night at 8.30, hearing about these new coins coming out and guys in three-piece suits um, that uh, went to Cambridge and Oxford. And uh, I said, so, this is big. Go to New Zealand. They have a crypto conference. New Zealand, everywhere in the world. So you need to have that tacit knowledge that this is, there's something. You, you then feel it, Robert. You feel the energy. You sure. feel the brain power of it. That's There's, what I said. I'm all in. Gotcha. There's no denying that. I mean, look, there is so much excitement, momentum. I mean, I remember that my audience probably thinks I'm a broken record. You know, I remember, you know, the Mount Gox days, you know, and uh, I have a story of where like I tried to buy it at 50 bucks and like I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to be verified and it wouldn't verify my accounts. So I missed out on it going from 50 to a grand. And I was just like, ah, and then of course, Mount Gox had that whole issue. But my, my long story short and saying, and I, and I, for full disclosure, I do own some Bitcoin. And, and, but my point in saying that is, you know, one, I've been following the space for a while. And the thing that I keep coming back to, and I, and I always, and, and I'm trying to understand is where are we at in terms of making money, not just in trading of the coins and the mining of Ethereum, Bitcoin, and, and other and other cryptos out there, you know, where where are the models being formed right now? You know, what what's happening in that space? Because I think, you know, from from people that might be more fundamental investors, you know, traditional, you know, stock investors looking for just revenues and all that kind of stuff, you know, it's it's hard to still wrap your mind around because they even they can't deny blockchain technology it will be revolutionary. I believe it. I think a lot of others without a doubt, believe it. But where are we at right now in terms of making money and putting some of these models out there and, and the adoption in that sense? We are early innings. You got to remember in 95, the two big internet companies were AOL and Netscape. Uh, and then the search still have engine- an AOL account. Yeah, uh, I mean, the search engine was uh, um, Ask Jeeves. Well, they're all gone, basically. And then Yahoo... Uh, and it's been fizzled away and put up with AOL and merged into uh, Black. Uh, no, is it um, uh, 
trying to think of the which of the uh, private equity funds have just purchased the uh, control of those vehicles. But I, I think you have to recognize that. And then back then it was nothing but eyeballs. You just wanted eyeballs and that led to an internet crash. I think one of the other parts that led to the tech bubble boom bust that took place was the fear of um, the new millennial, the new century coming in that all the computers will stop working and planes will fly out of the sky. People will be stuck in skyscrapers and the SEC is sending out emails to every public company and fund backup, 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 have backups for everything, secondary redundancy, what happens to this? And everyone overspent and there was no more to spend for, at least for a couple of years. And that's what led to the tech crash. That was everyone spent. Um, and that's where I'm a big believer that government policies are precursor to change. Um, and what we're seeing now, why it's important on blockchain, had, had all those weapons of mass destruction, as Warren Buffett liked to call them, uh, these credit default swaps, et cetera, been on a blockchain, you would not have had the crisis of Lehman Brothers. They would have known really quickly the magnitude. No one could figure out the magnitude. So the easiest thing was to let it go under. If the Federal Reserve could have written a check for $8 billion and stopped all the tragedy was on a blockchain. So that was a big wake-up call that really is, I think, with regulators, uh, they like that. And uh, they still wrestle, rightfully so, with uh, Bitcoin, we do not know that it's you and I that did a trade, but they know we did a trade in the U.S. or over in Asia. They can track where the coin has been. They just can't track who it's between. Uh, and that has to do with ushering up AML, which really caught attention after 9-11. So you see this one regulatory thing after the other. But the blockchain is bigger. And I think the blockchain is a big push and, and it, it stops so many mistakes that are done in accounting, like um, uh, coming back on uh, as an example uh, of, the, of the importance of bond market was created because of double entry accounting created back in the mid century uh, by an Italian. You know, that, that was really critical to all of a sudden bond market really evolving along with uh, other, the papacy changing some of the rules of usury laws. I think it's fascinating to watch how things evolve, but blockchain is significant and blockchain is profound. And Ethereum, the difference is Bitcoin is really the fiat. It's the currency. It's, it's sex appeal is there's only 21 million of them. That's the real big appeal. Uh, Ethereum is a smart contract. So you can embed information in that contract that's private between the two of us and, uh, and I think that that's what the magic. So the internet of things, the internet of the blockchain is really going to be around the algorithm of the smart contract of Ethereum. So when you recognize that in the past year, whenever Bitcoin goes up in enthusiasm, Ethereum outperforms. Uh, all, all, back in all the tokens that took place in 2017, they were all based on the algorithm, not a Bitcoin, but on Ethereum. So they dragged Ethereum up to all-time highs. They crashed, so did Ethereum. Now we have something much bigger and robust. We have DeFi. Uh, we have now NFTs, non-fungible uh, trading. You have um, stable coins. Very important for institutions because we saw during the winter of, of crypto in 2018, trash talking out of JP Morgan. Oh, 17, 18, right till they launched in, in February of 2019, they had launched their own stable coin, their own crypto. It's on the back of Ethereum. So institutions are coming out with, an, and a stable coin is like thinking of a money market fund. Money market funds grew to over more than 40% of all mutual funds. So the fact that you have this stable coin and it's growing, so the use of it growing means more Ethereum. So in the past 12 months, Ethereum's doubled. Holding Ethereum is much better than holding Bitcoin, but everyone's in love with holding Bitcoin. Uh, we've made much more money uh, and we're still the most profitable company out there because we mine Ethereum and Bitcoin. So let me ask you this, Frank, you know, what, when you think about the future of, of Hive's business, you know, right now, mining Ethereum, right? 
that's that's the main business line, right? Is is mining Ethereum? You and know, the growth though, the growth is is Ethereum is Bitcoin, right? This year, the uh, Bitcoin will take our revenue. If we had all our equipment running today, I think our revenue would be a uh, hundred million a quarter, making seventy million. But I mean, is there a sales sale strategy? Because it's only recognized once once you do sell some of it. So do you do 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 you actually trade it, or are you just it, it's all sometimes in, we trade. No, no, we, trade. Okay. we we have an algorithm that trades it. So okay. um, uh, last year we had to trade out uh, to buy and upgrade all of our all of our GPU chips from four gigabyte memory cards to eight, uh, and and that's a big order. I mean, and we're talking about like a million of these little puppies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can and imagine stacks yeah. of eight, you know, and uh, um, but I, I think that what's important for listeners is is for what Hive is doing is Hive wants to be we're the first public company last year, as you know, in 2017, a lot of copycats came in and then we really showed up as the most liquid when crypto runs. We lead the pack. Uh, what we saw was Riot and in particular Marathon were able with capital markets, use capital markets, and they were able to get really cheap capital. Uh, the shares of standing in Marathon went from less than 10 million to 80 million, eightfold increase. And all they did was buy up all the equipment that's coming in the future. Uh, Riot went from 25 million to 85 million shares also. Uh, the stocks went up because of the IFCOM, what's gonna become from the machines. They both bet on everything on Bitmain, uh, we deviated from that uh, because we had some bad experience of equipment coming on time. So we have other sources of ASIC chips. Uh, and so we want to be the thought leader. So we're the first to buy our own data centers, uh, which to me is you know, interesting because we know that on the balance sheet, long term, it creates tremendous economic value. You also uh, control your rents. When you have to rent uh, these landlords for a lot of these uh, uh, facilities or gouging Bitcoin miners, uh, that's my experience uh, in that. So I said, okay, I don't like that. I want to minimize. So I'll buy my own facility. The GPU one transaction has been a, a real important part for me in the vision of going to $10 billion as I needed the A team. And I have young guys that have been steeped in, in data center science but never really made the big score. And now they have the chance. So it's a thrill to have them on my team. I have real technical, those kids with explicit knowledge that I need, I've got it now. Um, but coming back on the sort of that vision of being first mover. So now we see Argo is buying their centers and Riot. So I paid $300,000 uh, per megawatt. Riot's just spent $2 million. So I see the coming path. Now I'm seeing HUD 8 running out and paying what I was paying 200 for a chip. They're paying uh, 4,000 for a chip uh, to mine Ethereum. So we're the first to be there. And I think that that's where we want to be. We're the first to do a stock swap of uh, helping on a DeFi company because we know they use Ethereum and they have other revenue generation programs. So that's worked out for them, worked out for us. And our vision is to, dividend that out to all our shareholders. So they'll all belong the DeFi stock also and get to participate in that new sector because maybe this will be the company that'll be the Google. I don't know. Going back, who knows, back in, in the 90s. So, so is that, so that, so it sounds like the real vision that you're looking out if, if it's three to five years is that is continuing to build up the war chest, so to speak, via mining and then be able to deploy that into strategic investments that you hope will be then the future of the internet or internet of things technology that are utilizing blockchain. Is that, what, is that what I'm hearing? It's hardware and software. So the software growth is going to come from people launching mm -hmm. NFTs, uh, um, DeFi's, et cetera. That'll be a big growth sector. That'll be apps and software. The hardware is going to be very important. Own the data center. They trade at huge multiples. Like if you take a look at that, those public companies, they, they get very rich multiples on revenue per share, on cash flow per share. Uh, and, and so it tells you that there's just a huge pent up demand for them. Uh, and if you look at the growth in the cloud, 
the, the cloud business is really was significant for artificial intelligence to explode. Well, now you're going to have smart cities. You slap, put cameras on every lamppost and they can read the, all the license plates at nighttime, do facial recognition, and you can protect the whole community. Uh, guess who loves that? Women. Women feel safer. Very important. Children, bad guy coming in the area, the, the AI can recognize their face. Uh, cars, the stolen cars, it can recognize and alert the police right away. That's how things, these data centers are going to be important for that. Uh, rendering for AI, data centers, uh, animation for films, for Pixar's of the world. Uh, you need uh, AI and you need data centers. So I think that data center infrastructure is going to be important balance sheet item, along with huddling is a balance sheet. So that, that gives you this sort of, you live it better through the crashes and, 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 and takeoffs. And then it's going to be where I get the highest income. Right now, if you have a tier four uh, data center and you're doing rendering uh, you, and, and Amazon, take a look at the prices, is just as profitable as crypto mining. So I want to own the data center. I want now the highest performing ETH. Um, GPU chips. Why? Because they can mine short term uh, Ethereum or Ethereum Classic for a bit. But at the same time, when that goes away and everyone goes to proof of stake for Ethereum, which I don't think is for three years, well, the, the longevity of these cards is massive. So all I can pivot with my data center, then all of a sudden I'm giving you tier four data center and giving you rendering services and AI. So it allows me to have a, a super long-term vision for this company. I see. Okay. All right. Because because really what I was getting to is wanting to understand the industry, you know, the 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 crypto mining opportunity and really what it is more so than just, you know, we're we're mining for these for Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever coin it is right now. You know, like that's that's really what I was trying to understand a bit better. It's like, okay, well, what's well, what's the if I'm gonna look to two, three, four, five years out, well, what else is there? You know, and 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 that that was interesting. It's big. It's long-term trend. It's a very significant big trend. You're, as I said, you're early. Like on the internet, you're 95. And, and there's going to be lots of casualties in the first big run. Um, uh, and, and what I've seen now is the CEOs of the other crypto mining companies, they've elevated. There, there's much stronger uh, depth of CEOs. Uh, and when I go on panels now, you know, I, I don't feel like uh, um, Wayne Gretzky playing with uh, high school hockey players or Michael Jordan playing with high school basketball players. They're really smart. They know capital markets. They know their industry. So uh, it's, it's I, I can see that the industry of mining executives is really upgraded. It's fantastic. Um, but, you know, I'm going to give you a great story. It's terrible nope. watching uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. I mean, two brilliant uh, guys, like really brilliant investors, but they're still fixed mindset now and so old school that there were a, that is, it was shameful the way they trash talk Robin Hood and then they trash talk Bitcoin. What they don't realize is that millennial kids that have been doing gaming business, which is a massive, massive global industry, uh, have been rewarded in a digital money in that software. And if they're the best of breed, and then there's global competition that fill out Madison Square Gardens. So it's a it's a brand new paradigm. They don't know about it. They're so oblivious. They're still thinking, I mean, "Where's my Dairy Queen? Uh, and where's my Geico Insurance?" You know, they're not seeing that other trend. Um, and so, I see that the millennials are much faster to adapt digital, and they don't realize in China, eighty percent of all trades are done from your like smartphone. Uh, there's no cash. There's no credit cards. It's all done from your smartphone. And that's they're just ahead of us there. And kids in America are way ahead of accepting digital money. The easiest story as a gold miner and a natural resource expert is to understand the story of diamonds. So diamonds really didn't have a whole lot of big value. De Beers' brilliancy was forming the cartel to limit supply, like limit the supply of, uh, of Bitcoin. It's limited. That limit supply, look at copper now, new multi-year high. Why? Supply is limited. Big demand. Supply is limited. 
Metcalf's law comes in and says it grows exponentially. This is simple. This is really simple. Is there another way? And the only way to do it with, with oil was a cartel. And so De Beers does it. And they sell something called intangible love, a commitment, an endorsement of this thing called love is represented with a diamond. Something tangible represents something intangible. And if enough people trust it and believe it, it goes up in value. It goes from $100 a stone to $500 a stone to $1,000 a stone to $10,000 a a carrot. And then you get gradations of carrots. because And so now all of a sudden they can take inferior stones and say, well, it does have this luster, therefore it's a different V visibility. And it's amazing to see how they created out of this one stone, uh, incredible value. So you have to have people to trust. If they believe that, it goes up in value. Value is about trust. Now, De Beers does it again in the 60s in Japan. Japan's economy is starting to take off. They go over there. Women never got engaged with a diamond ring. They all now want to rock. So you can take something. When you take Bitcoin and you track the number of wallets being created, you can see if the supply is limited, it goes up exponentially. Okay, what helps Bitcoin at 50000 What kid can afford 50000 don't worry, you can do it on PayPal. You can buy a fractal. You can buy $500 worth. You can buy a thousand. Now, if you bought a thousand dollars worth at $10,000, so it's a thousand dollar investment, and today that's worth $5,000, well, that's a big score. I can sell some of that and buy a new TV. And off my PayPal, you can't buy a stock on PayPal. You can't buy an ETF on PayPal, but you can buy Bitcoin. Think of this. This is incredible. 80 million people all of a sudden can buy fractals of something. That means Metcalf's law prevails and projects it, to mu- projects it to much higher prices. So as people believe and more trust, that's what happens. Got it. So, Frank, I asked you this question when we did our panel uh, a few weeks ago, but I, wa- I wanted to ask you again on here. You know, what? what's, what's the the existential threat, the biggest one to everything having to do with crypto and digital assets. You know, it's, gonna, I, like, it's, what, it's, what, all, it's what always short term government policies. Yeah, all, uh, that's it. Uh, that's it. But uh, I don't think so. Right now, Bitcoin is the number one currency trade within Africa because of bad governments. Uh, Venezuelans, the number two, two places, one in two places for ATM machines to get your Bitcoins out of or buy them is in Orlando and Miami. Well, why is that? It's the only way Venezuelans can get their money out in Brazilians, uh, Argentines. So I, I think that uh, it helps people. Uh, so I, I think we're, we're in a sort of an interesting secular bull market in the cycle. It's going to be extremely volatile. Everyone should be really aware. Gold is less volatile than the stock market. Uh, crypto and Tesla are way up there on daily volatility of six, seven percent. And you have to be able to stomach that if you're going to go into the space. I rep- I always tell people 10 percent should be in gold and a diversified portfolio rebalance once a year and two percent in crypto. If you don't want to buy an exchange, I'll go to Coinbase open account. You can use Hive as your proxy. All right. So we're actually picking up uh, where, where Frank and I left off. Uh, we did our first First, I, I think it was about 45 to 50 minutes of this interview uh, back on May 12th. And I, I, we only had a short time frame. So I, I had a couple more questions because, I mean, look, I, I, like I said then, I think me and Frank could talk for hours uh, about what's going on in crypto and what he's up to. So, you know, uh, to pick it kind of right back up uh, from that recording, we did that on May 12th. Today is May 27th. You know, oh, I didn't mean, even since then. So much has happened just from the macro scale to what's going on with some announcements from Hive, you know, but I had to I had to ask you because I'm, I'm sure you knew this was coming. You know, Elon Musk was on on SNL on uh, I think what was it, May 10th or it was it was that weekend before. And I didn't get to ask you, you know, because it had an effect on what was going on in crypto. It was wild. You know, so when things like this happen, you know, what how do you think about it? Are you just kind of do you just kind of sit back and watch and like, all right, you know, this. You, you mentioned it even then on the May 12th interview that volatility is expected. Volatility happened. 
you know? So uh, what, what do you do in these situations as a, as a business owner running a company in crypto mining? What, what, how do you think about these things? Well, I've got lots of experience in the gold world and uh, <laughs> in the ground floor of the creation of many companies like Wheaton River when it was, uh, and then Silver Wheaton being spun out of it. Now it's Wheaton Precious and it's the second biggest royalty company in the world. The volatility at the beginning was immense. Uh, and so you just have to recognize that this is an industry that's, that's uh, new. So it, is, it too is going to be volatile. Um, I did speak last week. I was on a call with a group of other CEOs of Michael Saylor uh, with Elon Musk. Um, and, uh, you know, the thought process is, is that there's some, there's some geopolitics here is the way I look at it. Uh, he needs to get his green tax credits. Uh, if there is a theory out there that uh, Bitcoin miners are using all this energy, which I think is way off overstated, the gold industry uses more than Bitcoin mining and banking is far, far bigger in absorbing the cost of energy than uh, Bitcoin ever does. But there are some real issues and the issues have to be China. And what we ha saw last weekend, two weeks ago was, was uh, Elon Musk and then last week was China. China is coming out with a digital currency. China is buying gold. There is a tectonic plate shift that's taking place in macro factors. And we've been seeing gold for the past 12 years shift over to China. China's the biggest gold producer in the nation. China's the biggest importer of gold. They want to support their currency like the U.S. has Fort Knox and has the most gold behind it. China, to be, have legitimacy, has to get more gold behind it. So if it wants to be a trading currency, they're going to a digital currency. So they don't want any competition. And the only way to make it legit is to have gold backing it. So there's this big trend going on and crypto mining is coming to North America. And, and you're seeing this other big shift, which is great for pools because there's better transparency and accountability here. Uh, China right now is about 60% of all the Bitcoin production. And they predominantly were using uh, coal in Inter Inter Mongolia. That's shut down now. That's done. So what's happened with all this turmoil is some very positive things. One, there was a great concern of not getting your bit main uh, S19s on time, if your cannons, if your uh, whatever it was, there was these delays and disappointments and machines coming on a timely basis. Well, they can no longer sell to mainland China. So on the weekend, we get calls. Can we co-locate with you and use your hosting? Uh, we got 100,000 S19s we got to find a home with. Uh, the largest exchange uh, that has their own machines that are in China, they're, they've got another massive block. They're looking for some electricity places around the world. So it's interesting. What will happen, I think, is that A, we'll get our machines better, which will actually make us stronger footprint. Uh, which is better for the ecosystem because the majority of us uh, were uh, green focused as miners, North America. And now I would say it's a hundred percent because Elon Musk's shame game basically uh, had marathon all of a sudden do a pivot that didn't care. They were using coal and now they've gone a, a 180, which is great. They've done a wonderful job pivoting and moving and getting with the mainstream. Um, the drag for me as, as the CEO, uh, interim CEO and executive chair is probably a better term for high blockchain, is that when we created High, which was the first crypto mining company to go public, we created it with an ESG strategy. We are only green energy and we've only been green energy, but we got tagged with all the rest of them. And it's just sort of frustrating how that unfolded. Uh, but that's what happens uh, in, the, in the capital markets. Industries will can all of a sudden move as a group. But for the shareholders of Hive, uh, the business is doing well. Uh, our, our assets went down. You know, what we're hodling goes from $110 million down to $90 million, and now it's back up to 92 But we're still mining. We're profitable. Um, uh, and, and we have new machines coming on. Our hashing power is going. I think by the end of uh, June, the goal is to have over 500 petahash, and that by the end of August, uh, 1.2 exahash. So that means that uh, we'll be doing like another 100 million in revenue. Um, our run rate with Ethereum predominantly 
uh, we were pushing before this big correction to Ethereum. When Ethereum was 4,000, our run rate was about $180 million a year uh, with you know, very uh, healthy, robust uh, profit margins. So from that end, how do you pivot? Just stay focused on your cash, your cash flow. Stay focused on getting delivery of your equipment and get them implemented. Uh, that's very, very important that we just execute on what our vision is. Uh, and then look at acquisitions. We've had uh, one company come to us and say, we'd like to do a reverse takeover, take over you. And we've got two exa hash, uh, but we don't have enough money to buy the second tranche of these coins. And uh, you've got a great market share and we'll be your savior. We, no, it's not going to happen. You know, it, 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 it's, and you look under the kimono and what do you see? You see that they've got gas and they've got this, we're green energy only. That's what I try to tell everyone. Don't waste your pitch to us unless you're going to be focused on green. It's going to be wind. It's going to be solar. It's going to be hydro or it's going to be geothermal. And that's it. That's how we're focused. So, uh, you know, one question I have for you, because I think a lot of people out there that follow crypto markets might be following Hive, you know, and everything that you're doing, you know, they, I, I find it to myself is sometimes you're at a loss for the right resources to, to make sure you're reading more or less accurately what's happening. Because as you said, especially when, you, when you're talking about China, you know, there's misinformation all over the place. There's a lot of window dressing. You know, you always, you see the headline, you're like, okay, well, what is the underlying reason for that? Only saw you the tip know, of the iceberg. Right. You know, you, under that iceberg for Elon Musk, you have to ask, what's in it for him? Mm -hmm. Why would he do that? Well, it's simple. Uh, Janet Yellen loves him. He talked down Bitcoin. Uh, regulators do not like you to talk up any asset class. You can talk them down, but don't talk them up. Uh, so he gets his credit. So maybe maybe California is not going to give him all of his tax credits because the green movement there is saying that he's taking Bitcoin, which is harming the earth. So he has to find a way. So he makes them happy because there's big chunks of cash coming out of that. Uh, China. Uh, he talks down Bitcoin and China wants to have no Bitcoin because it's competition with their digital currency themselves. So he's a big winner with on a macro scale with China and with California and with Janet Yellen. So that's what's in it for him. Um, but what's the benefit for us as an industry miners? There is this big shift. We had about 20% of the, of the world's production on that. We're all decentralized as a group. But you want to think that it's very centralized when you think China's the main uh, producer. That's going away. It's going to go to Europe and it's going to come over here. So I'm in North America. So that's very bullish. Uh, he also pushed for this group to have more transparency and accountability of where your electricity is coming from and it's being sourced. That's great because that means that everyone's going to have to come up to our high standards because we set the bar. We were first to do this in many different ways. So I'm happy about that. So you also brought up, you know, we talked about volatility, how it's been kind of, you know, nuts. Let's, let's call it, not to make a pun, but let's call it Frank, right? Like it was nuts, right? So, I mean, how would you say the volatility that you've seen in crypto markets in your career, how is that compared to your experience when looking at the volatility of other asset classes? Is it different? Sure. Is it more intense? Is it, is it, crazier or is it eh, it's about the same it's just more technology it brought me back to when i was a kid as a junior analyst i just started working and uh it's before gold ran to 850 uh, it was 1978 going to 79 uh and and you saw these silver stocks before now they're gone sigma uh, uh gold mines and there were another silver corporation they were all merged eventually into lack but these stocks would gap 25 dollars like i never saw such things and then crashed down. Uh, the volatility was so great as all of a sudden the world was in 79 was really starting to shift towards gold and gold stocks until the crescendo in September of 1980. Uh, I saw that. That's what I felt like, holy shoot, this is what's going on. And when you're running back in that day as a brokerage firm, uh, you have margin call problems, you have five day settlements, you have all these other issues that have that have changed, but you have to make sure that you're not offside, your inventory on your traders on the floor. So you have to, what my skills learned from that volatility, I'm able to apply today to Hive. 
Well, so to close this out, Frank, you know, before I let you go, what advice do you have for new investors? Because there's new people every single day that are now starting to look at the crypto market. So what, what are, what are some, what's some advice that you would have for them, uh, you know, before they go in and, and make their first investment? Just dabble. Don't don't go large. Just just do your research. Become involved with the, how it's changing. But you, you'll have to you know put your finger in the water. Don't plunge in and be silly about it. Just put your toe in. Uh, I've advocated to always ten percent winning in gold and rebalance once a year or once a quarter. Very good. Well, with that, Frank, where can our audience go and find more information about Hive Blockchain as well as U.S. Global Investors as well as uh, the Jet CTF? <laughs> well, you just go to usfunds.com uh, and you and sign up for our, our newsletter. As you know, it's, it goes out to tens of thousands. I think we have 100,000 readers in 80 countries around the world. Uh, we talk about crypto. We talk about gold. We talk about airlines. Uh, the Frank Talk blog is there. They're free. They're very inf- informational, lots of content. Um, but I think you go to high blockchain technology, uh, you go to highblockchain.com. That's easy. Uh, and you sign up to the letter that we publish. Uh, we just hired a, a wonderful newsletter writer that's a, that's very, a great expert in venture capital and technology, uh, Adam Sharp. And so we'll be coming up with our own, own sort of newsletter for Hive and crypto and what's happening in the crypto land. Uh, so I think from there, we produce a lot of great uh, short videos. Uh, these are what half 30 seconds to two and a half minutes explaining some of the complex and nuances for that new investor, but just get, get your toe wet and understand why it's transform for, it's transformative and it's a big secular trend. Very good. Well, Frank, thank you as always for joining me today. I really do appreciate it and uh, good luck. Continue to stay safe and, uh, I think we'll be seeing each other in person soon, hopefully. Everything's opening up. So, uh, so you know, we're going to this conference next week in, in Miami, and it just shocks me. It never a gold investment conference in the world has ever had 10,000 people sold so, out at $600 a pop. And the whale program is $15,000 a person. It's unprecedented. But that's the crypto space. Very good. Well, Frank, good luck with that. And uh, we'll chat again soon, okay? Thank you, my friend. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. This episode of the Planet Microcap podcast is brought to you by Friedman LLP, a top 40 global accounting, tax, and business consulting and advisory firm, providing a full spectrum of services for public and private companies since 1924. Contact Friedman when you will need to raise capital and adhere to U.S. standards. The Friedman partners will work diligently with you to provide the financial assurance, regulatory, and transactional services you need. When the stakes are highest, Friedman makes sure you are well equipped. For more information and to get a Friedman free consultation, please call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. Again, for more information and a free consultation, call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com.